Sal Carollo. How are you doing? An incredible human. I am so excited to have you on this week. I'm excited to be here. Francesco's cousin. Yes. Oh my God. Welcome to Let's Talk. Are you legit? <laughs> are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. You just looked at me like, oh, <laughs> we get deep. We do get deep. I'm ready. Okay. You had a rough last kind of year or two? Yes. You had two losses. Yep. Your mother and then Francesco. I really wanted to start with your mother. I know that there are so many people that lost a parent. And I think that if there's anyone at this point in their healing can speak from a true place of transparency and a little bit more of clarity can help people along. I would love to have you do so. I wanted to start off by just getting to know your mother and I wanted everybody to kind of get to know her too. How would you describe Rosalie? <laughs> a pain in the ass, no. Uh -huh. She uh, was, she loved hard. If she liked you, she loved you. Yeah. If she didn't, she didn't. <laughs> I love that. You know, she was very yeah, Italian yeah. in that way. Yeah. Um, but if you were in her corner, she had you for life. You know? She also had a lot of people in her corner. She had a lot of people. She was a popular woman. I she never was. seen anything like it she before. She was. She knew how to accumulate and curate friends. She didn't have time for like the bullshit. Yeah. You know, there's a, a lot of people bring bullshit into your life. And yep. she knew how to keep that hmm. away and to keep those good people in. What do you think like everybody loved the most about her? That's interesting. I think she just had a presence about her. Yeah. You know, she walked into a room you and knew. you knew she yep. walked into a room. You know, she had a way of being inclusive. Yeah. She never made anyone feel like an outsider. Yeah. You know, she didn't care if she knew you for 20 years or for two minutes. Right. You know, if you were in her house, in her home, she wanted you to feel comfortable. Yeah. You know, and I think that's what people remember most about her. Yeah. What was like your relationship with her growing up? Were you guys really close? Very close. Her and I were very similar in a lot mm. of ways. And I think that's why we used to argue a lot. Interesting. You know, uh, we're both opinionated. I love it. Uh, but she, we were very close. You know, she did a lot for us. Mm. You know, she was, she took the role of mom and wife very seriously. Mm. I think out of everything, that those were her two favorite roles. Mm. Um, maybe a little too much with the, with the mother <laughs> thing. You know, she was a self-proclaimed helicopter mom. Was she like very involved in your life? And almost like too involved. Like, what are you man. doing? Where are you at? Almost like too involved. <laughs> it's like, ma, please. I, I don't know if we have time for a story, but... Oh, please. We she, got nothing but time. She was a, a self-proclaimed helicopter mom. Okay. And there was one time I was like, I think it was a freshman in high school, maybe in middle school. And I, I was staying after school for something. And my phone died. And I didn't think it was that big of a deal. Like, she knew where I was. And I came home and my brother's like, you need to call mom right away. So she's out there looking for you. Stop. Like, I was held hostage. <laughs> I was in school. But she was very protective. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But she was, she was a lot, but I do miss that. I remember Francesco telling me that, like, when you guys were younger, and I remember seeing the pictures on his Instagram that you posted, or no, yeah, you posted, I saw on your Instagram, you guys used to do, like, family events, like, for yes. holidays and stuff. Yeah. Can I hear a little bit more about that, the Italian vibe to you? It's funny, because a lot of the times, it was in my grandmother's basement oh, on 76th remember. Street. Oh, forget about it. it. That was the party Street. spot. That was the party spot. Yes. And gotcha. we would all just congregate down there and have we all celebrate the holidays so yeah. we were all like why not just do it together yeah and it was just it was nice to see everybody and you know with francesco living in brooklyn brooklyn and me living in staten island we didn't see each other all the time right so it was nice to kind of see each other on the holidays and stuff gotcha and then like in your home it's you your father mm -hmm. it was your mother and then your brother mm -hmm. were you guys like a very close-knit family very Okay. Very, you know, my parents, every time they would go out, or not every time, but often, she, they would want to include us. Mm. You know, they yeah. were just, my brother and I were my mom's pride and joy. Mm. And my dad's also, but my mom really just, a mom's a mom. Yeah. You know? Well, I remember I have her on Facebook. Yeah. Forget about it. That's all. I only saw you. You were like a model on her page. <laughs> she, she was, she hated people. You know, you know what it is? She hated people who bragged about their kids. But right. She bragged about <laughs> yeah. kids. Which I'm not saying there's anything to brag about. Right. But no, I'm stop saying, it. I'm just saying it's like she kind of it was pot calling the kettle black. A little right. Bit. I love it. Was she like always a healthy woman? So mostly, yes. She had lupus, okay. which is an autoimmune right. disease. Yep. But um, 
it didn't really affect her life. There's with lupus, there's a level of severity. It depends. Mm. Hers was like the most mild case. Gotcha. You know, it wasn't that it didn't affect her life. The most that it impacted her was that she had to go to her rheumatologist mm. and get tested, you know, for things. And other than that, I mean, it didn't really affect her life. Mm. She was healthy for the most part. Because what I'm thinking is, is like when you guys found out that she got cancer, mm -hmm. was that something that was very shocking? Incredibly. Yeah. You know what it is? Because there was no, she had no symptoms. Mm. See, this is the tricky it thing. It wasn't like she was coughing for a while or she couldn't breathe where we we're like, okay, go to a doctor, mm. go to a pulmonologist and right. get this tested. Hers was, she just always went to a pulmonologist. She always got, she was always on top of her doctor. She was diligent about wow. it. Wow. Um, because I think she had pneumonia in the past and okay. they found scar tissue and she wanted okay. to get it, test, uh, get it checked. And what had happened was she went and every single time it was clean, clean there was nothing bad. Okay. And that last time they saw a mass on mm. the lung and it ended up being cancer. Can you talk me about talk to me about like what kind of cancer that she had? She had small cell lung cancer, which okay. there's non small cell, there's small cell, and I'm sure there are a bunch of other ones. Small cell is tends to be the most severe, the mm. most aggressive. Mm. It was in the lung? It's in her lung. Okay. And hence the name. Right. And listen, don't hold me on it. I'm not a doctor, but yeah. what I know about it is it's it's spreads more easily interesting okay and we were shocked because although she was a smoker in the past she hadn't smoked in 15 years gotcha so it was like why now right you know there are people who smoke for the, their whole lives and nothing happens do you remember that day that you found out i do what did that look like in the house so you know i tried to stay positive you know i'm a big firm believer in why panic about something that isn't set in stone yet yep Sure. You know, because then it's just going to cause more aggravation, mm -hmm. cause me to be more upset. And I remember I was on a work call mm. and I don't know why, what possessed me, but I said to my mother, how, you know, what did the doctor say? Like over text? No, she had walked in the door oh, okay. and she had said, it's not good news, but it's not terrible news. Okay. And I said, what, what is it? She goes, it is cancer, but it's treatable. And I had said... Okay, that sounds like terrible news. Mm, I mean, right. no one, you know, even though it's treatable, who wants their parent to have cancer? Well, when you look back now, do you think that she approached it that way so she was keeping you safe and like trying to protect you, and maybe she did feel like it was serious, or do you think she actually thought this is we're good? I think she was just taking it as what, how the doctor described it gotcha. to her. I don't think she wanted to jump to any conclusions. You know, mm. I think my mom didn't know enough about that cancer. Mm -hmm. You know, she had just gotten diagnosed. I think she was doing it more. She was like, okay, why right. not? Why panic about something that they say they can treat? Right. You know, they said it's not curable, but they said it's treatable. Okay. So, so she gets, so you guys find out that she gets cancer. Mm -hmm. Now time is kind of like happening. Mm -hmm. What is, how are you guys, what are you guys doing? Like, was she in treatment? Like, how was the household? Was everybody very involved? Yeah, she had to get chemo immediately. Good. And they gave her, they started off with the mo the most strong Strongest chemo. chemo. Okay. Um, and radiation, they had to do radiation oh, as well. Oh, okay, everything at once. Yeah, and what had happened was her cancer had spread to her femur. Hmm. So her leg was in, she was in agony. Hmm. And it kind of happened fast. Mm, I was going to ask. Because this. she didn't feel anything when mm. she got diagnosed. Then all of a sudden, she was, had this extreme pain wow. in her legs. Wow. And, you know, she had torn a meniscus in the past. I was trying to be positive and say, okay, maybe you tore a meniscus. You know, I didn't think mm. the cancer had spread. And she was, it was the worst experience. Yeah. Because here I am, it's the pandemic. Right. I'm working in the basement. I hear my mom screaming in agony. Mm. And you can't help the person. No. I can't help the person. Mm -mm. It's not like the you know the person has a fever yeah. where I can bring them medicine yeah. to Motrin to, to put, make the fever go down. Yeah. And it was just, we all were on edge. Yeah. And we didn't know what to do. I think that's like the most like painful part. It's like yeah. you're watching somebody that you love so much, so helplessly. You can't do anything. You can't. It's the, it's the worst feeling. It's the one, you know, we, we always like to be in control. Mm -hmm. And we like to be in control of other people's happiness especially those we love and when you see someone in so much pain and so much sadness and you can't help that person yeah and especially with cancer where you know 
the person's not gonna be in the person's gonna be in pain until the cancer goes away yeah that i think was just added on to everything so you were like one of the major caretakers in her life after my dad and I also was a caretaker, so I feel like this is our middle ground right now. Yes. I would love to hear from a caretaker's role. I guess, number one, how would you even... What what to you is a caretaker? Like, how would you describe, like, what that really is like? And, like, mentally, how was just being a caretaker overall? So, a caretaker, in my opinion, is someone who does it out of, out of their heart. Mm. Doesn't do it for a paycheck. Mm. Does it out of their love for the person. Yeah. Um, and it's a 24 seven job, okay. as you know, yep. you know, there's no go to bed, wake up in the morning and start all over. Mm. You know, my dad was the main caretaker mm. and he was there morning, night, wow. every hour. Oh, that love. And that's love, you know, and he taught me mm. what love is. You know, yeah. when you get married, your vow is through sickness and through health. Right. This is the prime example of that. And, you know, it, it mentally kind of destroys you mm. because you're kind of abandoning yourself. Oh, you said it perfectly. For this person, but you're yep. willing to do yep. that and you're happy to do that yep. because that person's more important to you yeah. than maybe you yep. are at that moment. Yep. You know, and we all kind of just, we need to say much. We all understood. Yeah. You know, it, it, but it, it does get to you mentally. Yeah. Do you feel like you were like slowly watching your mother like mentally fall apart? Or yeah, what? you know, she she stayed positive. You know, she never had any type of serious conversation with me about it. We all just took it one day at a time. But I, I sort of affect her. My mom was a very um, vivacious person. You know, she was always on the go. Yeah. She didn't sleep in. She was out, up and running. She loved to go shopping. She loved all that yeah. stuff. And, you know, that juxtaposition of having that person like that. And then all of a sudden, she's in a bed. Right. Can't move. Unable to move. Mm-hmm. And I think that bothered her the yeah, most. Yeah, gotcha. that aside from the pain, I think she, she the pain she understood was part of it. I mm. think the mobility aspect of it got to her the most. Do you feel like she was very accepting as to like what was going on? I think so. I think at the end, not to jump, but at the mm. end she had said to her friends, she always focused on my father and my brother and myself right even at the end she said it's not fair to them mm. it was she never said it's not fair to me to me it's not fair that i'm having to go through this truth it's not fair to them mm. i think she kind of accepted it for herself mm. and she said it is what it is i don't think she ever accepted it for us mm. do you feel like you accepted it before she passed i did i think when it was happening i kind of I started to get a little anxious mm. because I would think in the future and think about, you know, I kind of knew she was going to make it mm. deep down inside. And I kept saying, what happens when she goes? My whole life is going to change. What do I do? Right. And I realized it was causing so much anxiety. I needed to take a step back mm. and say, take it day by day. Yep. Be present. Be present. No, like, you know, with cancer, there are good days and there are bad days. Yep. If today's a good day, great. If it's not a good day, we're going to get through it. Mm. And just don't cross that bridge until we get to it. But I accepted it. I said, this is unfortunately part of my life. I think in the beginning, I was sugarcoating it. My mm. friends would ask, you know, how's she doing? I'm like, oh, she's great. Mm. No, she's good. And then I realized it wasn't helping the situation. Yeah. Because I was suppressing whatever I was feeling. When you were talking to your friends about it, do you feel like they understood? Or anybody for that matter? Friends, other cousins? It's hard for someone to understand when they're not in it yeah you know they can empathize mm -hmm. but they don't they don't really know right you know and all i kept saying to them was cherish your memories with yeah. your parents be thankful you know be grateful that you have them in good health be grateful that nothing's going on you know because it can change in in a, in a serious instant right i think you said briefly that it was a very quick process mm -hmm. It was a matter of months that she was just got diagnosed and then passed. She got diagnosed September of 2020. She died August 2021. Wow. See, and Francesco was September as well, and then he was uh, March. It's very fast. Very fast. I think at the end, when something's so aggressive, I, you know, of course, I'm not a doctor, but what it seems like to me is that it's usually months. 
mm. a year, maybe the most. Right. Yeah. What were like some of the things that till this day you think about before she passed away that like sticks with you that you like any memorable moments that you had with her, anything that you learned in that moment? You know, I towards the end, you know, before my mom got sick, her and I used to be the first ones up. In the morning. In the morning. Okay. And what we would do is I would go get coffee. She'd get coffee. But I couldn't talk to her before she had her coffee. Oh, no. she, was, she was a nightmare. Stop. <laughs> Sorry, Ma. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I would sit there. She would have her coffee and we would just talk about life. Right. Should talk. No. I love but, it. But we would just talk about life. And right. when she got sick and she couldn't go downstairs anymore, right. I used to bring the coffee up to her. Uh. I used to sit on the floor while she was in bed. Uh-huh. My dad was sleeping, so we would have to be uh-huh. really quiet and... You know, I would just, we would just chit chat about life. Wow. And it just, I, I think I tried to keep the normalcy. Gotcha. As much as I could. You know, I didn't want her to feel like everything changed. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I think even for yourself, it's like, I want to find that normality again. Yes. You know? Yes. Yeah. And, and the thing is, you have, part of the accepting is accepting that life will never be the same. Hmm. You know, you can try to attain normalcy. It's never going to happen. I got questions about that tequila shot that you told me about the yes. other day. Can yeah. we hear about it? So my mom, she liked to have a good time. <laughs> yeah. And I like to have a good time. I love it. So I think towards the end, um, my, my parents' anniversary was Cinco de Mayo. Oh, wow. Yes. And I originally wanted to have like a party for them, but my mom oh. was going through treatment and I couldn't. So... Her friends came over and there was tequila, and we were just throwing them back. Oh my she, god! She was in bed, and Stop. I was there, with, and we were just. Did she get together. drunk? No, she was like, "Oh, this is going down smooth." Oh wow! So we were we, we just had a great time. Wow! You know, and I think we tried to keep it as light yeah. as possible. How do you feel like you were able to find those moments? Like, how do you do? You have any like advice for people that are going through something? How how do you find those moments where you could just find that normality? I think through all darkness, there's light. Mm. And I think those good moments are maybe not look, may, may not look like they used to yeah. before that person went or before that person got sick. But they're still good. Yeah. You know, it may look different, but if your parent loved to have a margarita, go have a margarita with them. I'm honestly learning from you right now. I think that one of the best things that you did in that moment was staying present through it all. I think that's how you were able to find everything, like the good and the bad, those moments of normality. Like instead of like spending all that time thinking about like what my life is going to be, like let me just focus on what it is right now. Yeah. That's amazing. I did a lot of soul searching while she was sick. Really? And I had to kind of play therapist on myself. Mm. And I said, okay, where am I? How am I feeling? And how do I improve? Mm. You know, because I didn't want to go insane. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to go insane. It's very easy to lose yourself Mm -hmm. in the process. When you say um, soul searching, how? I just had to just center myself. Okay. Realize what really matters. Yeah. Compartmentalize my life. Right. Work is work, but home life is home life. And my family is very important to me. And family always comes first. Yeah. How is balancing like work, social life, your mom being sick at home? Were you able to balance it? It was hard. I yeah. think as an accountant, it was also busy season. So gotcha. I was working 55 hour weeks, mm. 10 hour days. You know, it was hard. Wow. I just had to take it day by day. Mm. Were you, you able know? to like, when you would go to work, turn it off and, you know, be at work and not think about it? To an extent, it was okay. hard because I was working from home mm. because of the pandemic. Oh. I think if I was getting up and going to right. the office, it would have been a different situation. Gotcha. But It was a little hard. Yeah. As an older brother and then having a younger brother, how was, do you feel like you were kind of holding the team for him? Yeah. You know, my brother is very mature. So he he was good at handling the situation. I just think even to this day, my heart breaks more for him Hmm. because he was a mama's boy. Oh. You know, like I wasn't a mama's boy. You weren't? I thought you were the mama's boy. No, we were close. Her, and my mother and I were close, but I was no mama's boy. <laughs> I was a debater. Like, okay, like, like a, but you said you guys were both opinionated. both opinionated. I can't imagine a debate there. So my mom would be like, would say something to me, and I'd be like, but why? Yeah. Give me a good valid <laughs> reason. Whereas my brother's like, okay, whatever. Oh. You know? So my heart broke, broke more for him. Yeah. Because 
you know, his mom was white. He, it must have been difficult for him to see her like that. Yeah. And to lose someone like that. When she passed away, were you present at the house? So she had gone to her doctor's appointment and they basically threw in the towel. Mm-hmm. And they basically turned around and said, you know, the cancer had spread to your bones. Wow. There's nothing else we can do. Because what had happened was her white blood cell count, she was getting infusion after infusion. Right, yeah, Francesco too. It wasn't going up. Mm. And they were like, why isn't this going up? Right. And she, they basically said, it spread to your bones. Mm. And there's nothing else we can do. There's no treatment. There's no surgical procedure. There's nothing we can do. And they said there's like a, I found the percentage and my mom turned to my dad. I wasn't there, but my mom turned to my dad and said, doesn't look that great. Mm. And my dad said, it doesn't matter if it's 5%, 10%, you got to be part of that percent. Mm. You know, one of my last things my mom said about my dad was he was her rock. Yeah. You know, he kept her grounded. Wow. And, you know, we kind of all knew it was coming. Right. So after my mom found out, they went to Jose Tejas for people who are in Jersey and they they went she, to the tequila spot again she had two margaritas stop it she goes i need a drink period she goes, I had a drink and what's ironic wow what's ironic is that's where they got engaged wow so it was like the first dinner and their last wow wow and wow, wow, wow that was their last dinner their together. last dinner together wow and she threw back how threw, beautiful threw mar- two margaritas and she came home okay we knew what was coming okay we tried to mentally prepare ourselves as much as you can and we were all there. We were all there. And that last day, I remember, the days leading up, she had gone into a coma and oh. she was just not... No longer able to speak? She wasn't able to speak. She was being responsive. If I said, are you in pain? She would mm. squeeze my hand. Oh, okay. And I would give her morphine. Okay. And then that last um, morning, I remember I woke up and I looked at her. And my biggest fear, I wasn't sleeping because my biggest fear was wake being woken up in the middle of the night yeah. that she had passed away. Okay. I had gone through that with my grandfather, so I didn't you know, Want imagine with my it. mom. Yep. And that morning I woke up, I remember it was like 6 a.m., and her breathing got really labored. Mm-hmm. And I walked I know into, exactly what you're talking I about. I walked into the room, and I looked at her, and I said, are you in pain? I squeeze my hand if you're in pain, and she wasn't squeezing my hand. Mm. She, I think she was totally gone. Gone. And I said, okay, so I gave her morphine, because I had assumed she was in, in pain. I could imagine. And I remember I whispered in her ear, you're not going to be in pain much longer. Mm. And I, I walked out. And I remember before I walked out, I looked at her and I said, she can't go on another day like this. Because mm. that's not fair to her. That's not fair to us to have to witness this. No, you're absolutely right. You know, because, and people would explain that to me. Yeah. People, you know, people who lost their... You got me tearing up for you. It's so true. Uh, it's horrible it's to horrible. watch. It's and horrible. And people explain it to me who have lost a parent and I would say they said that they were calm at the end and I remember saying how could you be calm I yeah. feel like I'd be in a straight jacket in a padded room like, like right you know you think. and then that day came mm. you never think you're gonna be in that situation right and I said I remember I said God just take her mm. let her be in peace I said because she's holding on for what yeah. cancer's not gonna magically go away no. you're not gonna get your miracle no you know and if people believe in miracles that's great but I don't, you know. Do you? I believe that there have been miracles for people, but I never think the miracle's going to be for us. Mm. I just, I don't, I don't know why. Yeah. I just think, you know, I believe in power of prayer. I believe in people being there for you, but I think at that point, the the chances of a miracle happening were so far gone. Yeah. You know? I totally agree. And so 6 a.m., I said that to her, and 20 minutes later, she passed away. Wow. It's so interesting because the way that, like, you were able to, like, navigate in a situation where, for me, I did, like, a a TikTok live prayer. I don't know if you know about it. And it was just so empowering. And, like, I truly thought that, like, it worked. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like, so for me, I was on, like, a completely different side of a spectrum. Which is fine. I think it's a beautiful thing. And I wish I had more of that. I wish I had more of that. I wish I had more of that. I think I was just too realistic. That's. I think that might not be the worst thing in the world. I don't know. Well, you know, it goes both ways. Yeah. I think in the moment, the pain lessens when you're more positive. Mm. It wasn't that I wasn't positive. I just was like... This is what it is. She's in a a coma. Yeah. Like, they can't go up from here. Yeah. Well, I 
just want to say that you are just like so brave because Thank to you. be able to be so self-aware in such a traumatic situation for someone like your mother mm-hmm. wow i mean you, you are so it. powerful i appreciate there's it. like nothing that you can't take on in this world at this point thank you right it's just like it doesn't get worse than that it did change my perspective on life yeah and it changed you know i used to sweat the small stuff all the time mm. every little inconvenience i was like oh. the world is ending. <laughs> yeah i think when after she, especially when she got sick and then after she died i said to myself did it really matter did it really matter mm. like this is what life's about mm. your family your friends yourself that's what life is about this other stuff isn't yeah you know who cares what people think I wanted to pick your brain about that. Supposedly, the word on the block is you mastered it. I don't no. care. How? I don't care. And I say that with the most humility, but I just, I don't care yeah. what people think. I think before before my mom died, I was almost, I cared too much. Mm. Now I don't care. Mm. You know, I worry about my family, my friends, myself. People that matter. Work. Yeah. You know, my own life. You know, I don't care what the people that aren't in my life. Yeah. You know, it's just, I always say the sun still rises and the sun still sets. Mm. Everybody's grief is different. Yeah. I would love to hear what, how would you describe your grief process? Like, what did that look like for you? After she had passed away, after like the wake and the funeral and all that stuff, no one was in my house. Okay. It was me, my dad, my brother, and the dust had settled. And I remember I said, I was in bed and I woke up and I said, now what? Mm. Now what? I was in kind of a, this, it felt like a dream. Yep. And now I had woken up. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, so now what? What do I do? My mom had done the bills. I had to learn how to do the bills. Mm. You know, there was so much to learn and I didn't know where to start. I was so overwhelmed. And it was true. It's true when they say the rug gets pulled from under you. But I had felt like I was picking up all the pieces. Right. We're all like, well, what do we do? And I just feel like I took it day by day again. Again. I took it day what by day. What a great day. advice. I, I said, this Honestly. is my life. Yeah. This is my, unfortunately, this is what happened. I refuse to let myself feel like a victim. Mm. I think it's very easy to feel like a victim. Absolutely. I think when you treat yourself like a victim, you start to feel like one. No one wants to feel like one. Yeah, you're right. And I said, I'm not going to feel like a victim. I'm going to tackle this and make the most of the rest of my life. Mm. The pain will always be here, but I am, I am at peace. A lot of people don't know how to approach somebody that's grieving. Yes. How do you like to be approached? I, you know what I, what I liked was when people said, um, how are you doing? Mm-hmm. Simple. How are you doing? Yeah. That's it. Because I think that it's okay not to be okay. Yeah. And I think I told you that when Francesco was sick, like yeah. towards the very end. Oh, we're getting into that. And we had a conversation. And I don't remember. Through text. Yeah. And you seemed very helpless. And you didn't know where I, you looked lost. You seemed lost. And I remember I said to you, it's okay not to be okay. Mm-hmm. You know, we live in a society where people expect us to, things to happen and us to bounce right back. Like nothing happened. Yeah. Because even though our world stops, the actual world doesn't. Yeah. You know, it doesn't. Sun still rises and sun still sets, as I said. But I think it's okay not to be okay. When people ask, how are you doing? It's okay to be like, you know, today... I'm really hurting. Yeah. And that's fine. And those who really love you will understand that. Have you ever got like a text of like somebody checking in on you and you're like, I'm just not in the mood to talk about this today? Or are you more like, I like to address this when it's asked of me? When people ask me, I would answer. I would say, I'm doing okay. Mm. Not doing great. Yeah. I wouldn't go into specifics. Yeah. You know, I would just, you know, they would try to, and I would, I would entertain it. Depends on it. the day. Depends on the day. Right. But I wouldn't have like a full-blown conversation about it. Mm. It's all my, my own personal journey, you know? Yeah. And if they don't understand, they don't understand. Because I think it's important to like, for us to normalize, like, you know, sometimes you just don't want to speak about it. And it's okay to say, hey, not today. Not today. You know? It's normal. It's okay. It's no- Sometimes you just want to be left alone. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, and I, I don't mean to sound so You're blunt, right. but it's sometimes you just want to be left alone. Yeah. You know, you have a headache enough from what happened. Mm -hmm. Why be constantly reminded of it every single time someone asks? It's so intriguing to me how you had all this happen to your mother. You were so hands-on 
on watching this all unravel and being a caretaker. And then you find out that your cousin, that's your age, is this is all happening again. It was wild. And like kind of the same year, right? Was it? It was. All within like a year and a half. It was. Yeah. Because my mom died August 29th, 2021. And I remember at the wake, you and Francesco came Mm -hmm. and I saw Francesco's face Mm. and he looked destroyed. Mm. I remember his face. I vividly remember the way he looked at my mom in the casket. He was not having it. He was so upset. He was. And a few months later was when he got diagnosed. It's crazy too because at that wake... Not only was he so distraught that she passed, he I remember him said said to me, like, am I next? He said that to you. Yeah. You know, like, this is, it hurts me to see cancer patients not make it. It makes me feel like I'm next. It's upsetting you know? to know that he, that went through his mind. You know, he went through a lot. He did. And especially to that point, he battled it for so long. For him to still think that after all that time. Yeah. Well, I think that, he just knew how strong your mother was too and he knew how much life she had and I think almost in a way she reminded him of himself. Like he was mm-hmm. very outgoing and he had all those they, friends. They were a lot right? alike in that sense. And like when yeah. they were together in a room they were kicking it off. Yes. Like forget about it. Yeah. So there, it was so deeper. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it, it was. I think that they had a special bond. They did. They, they had a special bond. She was like his son as well. Yes. My mom loved Francesco. Loved and Francesco loved my mom. It was just, they just had a special bond. Yeah. He'd be like, see ya. And my mom would, you know, her heart would melt. You know, yeah. it was just, they just, she really loved him. And I remember when he got diagnosed the first time. Mm. Um, what, how old was he? Like 17? He was 17, yeah. That New Year's, when the, when the clock struck 12, my mom started crying. And I never told anyone this. Mm. It's the first time. My mom started hysterical crying. And her friends were like, in a row, like, what's wrong? She goes, Francesco. And I don't know what the year is going to bring. She was so worried. Wow. And how ironic that wow. at her at her wake, he felt that. He way. felt that it's like they like shared a connection because, I don't know if we spoke about this, but we have a medium that to this day we're still trying to understand: are mediums real? Are they not real? But supposedly, your mother and him are having a great time in heaven. That's the word on the block. I've, I've talked to mediums and the same thing. They wow. say the same thing to me. She is like the person that crossed him over. She is like his mother figure up there. She's shown him the ropes, keeps yes. him safe. Like that's um, so beautiful. I'm not surprised. Like, I'm when, not either. When, when like the medium told me that, I remember saying, makes sense. Yeah. I'm glad. You know, I'm glad that right. they have each other. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's very surreal still. So surreal. Well, when you came in, you came to visit Francesco the last week. Mm -hmm. And like I said, me and his mother were very like, we're going to figure this out. And I don't know if you felt that energy in the house when you walked in. I think that being somebody that's watched this happen before, I think you might have known some things that we didn't. What was that like for you seeing everybody in the house navigating? You know, I believe that everyone should let others figure things out on their own yeah you know i don't think it was my place to say this i'm not a doctor you right. know what i mean yeah. and i think hope is a beautiful thing mm. and if you can keep if you can have hope even at the last moment god bless you yeah. and that's what you had that's what his mother had that's what his father had um i did know things i saw the way he was that last time before i had gone to see him i had a feeling this time was a little different mm. I just had a feeling. I don't know what it was. And I walked in kind of knowing what to expect. Mm. And when I walked in and I saw him, he looked tired. Yeah, exhausted. Like mentally, physically. Tapped. Tapped. Yeah. And I remember I remember saying to myself, this poor kid, mm. you know, he's, he's really hanging on. Hanging on. He, he doesn't want to go. No. He did not want to go. He didn't. And he, he was like, just the way, like he refused to go to sleep. Yeah. Like his head, he would keep trying, right. keep his head up. Yep. And I just, you know, part of me wanted him to know it was okay. To go. To go. Yeah. You know, I think watching him like that, I'm sure was more painful for you guys, you know, than him. I don't want to 
sugarcoat him going. Mm. But I think just watching him at 24 years old slip away, I think it was easier for him to go on. Yeah. You know? Well, you said it perfectly. You know, when you're watching somebody suffer so much, it's like, it's just not fair to them. You're a Part of you is like, just go. Just go. Just go. Like, I, I don't want, I can't have this for you. No. So it's like deep down, like we all felt like that. But I think there's a part of us that were selfish. It was like, I just which can't is, let go. Which is warranted. Yeah. And I think I want people who are listening to this to know it's okay to be selfish. Yeah. It's okay to not want the person you love to go on. Mm. You know, when my mom was sick, you know, people were saying, tell her to let go, tell her mm. to let go. And I told her to let go because I had accepted the situation. Right. My brother had told her to let go. My dad wouldn't tell her to let wow. go. He never told her to let go. Because I think that he didn't accept he didn't accept the fact that she was going. Yeah. So I think it's okay to be selfish. You have every right to be. Yeah. You know, not everyone's going to sit there and say, go on, you know, I'll see you one day. Right. How can you? You know, I did, I think, because I just, I saw. I you just, saw. I kind of had accepted it. Yeah. Which I think was a blessing in a lot of ways. So I was saying. able to. Um, but... It's okay to be selfish. Yeah. You know, be selfish for once. It's right. okay to be selfish. You said that you had like a very interesting last phone call with Francesco. Yes. I wanted to hear about it. I called him when he got diagnosed the last time. Okay. I think it was may- maybe October. Yes. And I called him and I said, you know, I asked him how he was doing. And it was the most vulnerable I had ever heard him. Mm. He was always a big macho, t- tough guy. Big macho, tough yeah. guy. Always saying, I'll beat it. I'll be yep. fine. I'll be everything's good I'm good it was the first time he said to me people think this doesn't affect me and it does it was the first time he said something like that to me and I remember being on the phone and saying to myself he he gets it yeah he understands he understands he understands I think he was getting to him and he said to me I'm praying to your mom to get me through this he said that to me and I said she's got you Mm. and in my head you know, I thought he was going to beat it at that point because mm. he had done it so many times prior. And But I said, even if he doesn't make it, she's going to be there to get yeah. him. I knew it. Yeah. Wow. I, I knew it. And I hung up the phone and I said, he's in good hands mm. yeah. on this earth. And even if it doesn't. Yeah. The whole just idea of like cancer and just the journey of you know half of it being the caretakers that are involved and the person themselves that's suffering like just everything it's so mentally draining and I just want to like reiterate that idea because like I just want to say like it's okay to just feel drained like it's it's exactly what it is like it's okay it's okay it's okay not to be okay exactly you You said it perfectly it's okay you know you can't be at the top of your game when something like this is happening. Yeah. And if you are, God bless you, but I certainly was not. Most people aren't. It's okay to say, I'm not okay. And I'm probably not going to be okay for a really long time. Yeah. You know? And it's okay to be drained. It's okay to take a moment and reevaluate. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I think it's also, I love what you said, that you were kind of like soul searching in the mix of it because I'm just wondering if there's a way to like, challenge ourselves sometimes to take a step back when things are getting super hectic and like checking with ourselves because in order to show up for other people you gotta like just be there for us too like you know yes and i remember when francesco was sick you had said we were i was at the house and you had turned around to me and said i'm losing myself Hmm. i remember you said that to me and i said you were like i I need to go to the gym i need to do something and i said you should Hmm. i said go you can't be here 24-7. How are you going to take care of someone when you're not taking care of yourself? I know. You need to do... You need to. Do, I know people feel guilty I doing that. I felt so guilty. You said it per- you I was really just doing that. that. There's a guilt In that aspect. moment. And I think people should take that out. Mm. Remove guilt. Absolutely. Because that person who's suffering mm. would want you to go. Yeah. I'm glad you said you that know? because to this day, I'm still healing from that guilt. Don't be guilty. Yeah. I released all guilt. Hmm. When my mom was sick and, you know, we got into fights and I might have said things that were not the nicest, <laughs> I said, I'm sorry for this, I'm sorry for this. I was like, I was, I was like in confession. I was like, I'm, I'm so like, I, I was like, I was like, but, you know, I released all the guilt and I made it 
kind of a mission for me mm. when she died. I'm not, I'm dealing with grief. I cannot deal with grief and guilt. Yeah. I can. That's too much. And They're so powerful too, feelings. Right. And I think, you know, people who are, who's ever out there dealing with this, remove the guilt. Mm. You're going through enough. Yeah. Why make your life harder? Right. The guilt isn't going to bring the person back. When you're feeling like deep pain because, you know, we learn to move forward, but it's always like a part of us. And sometimes we have those moments where we're like, ah, this hurts. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you do to help yourself along? Is it like you go to the gym or? You know what it is? It's so simple. But mm. I, I love simple. I go to the cemetery mm. and I just sit there mm. and pray. And I also remember the good times with her. I listen to music. Wow. Just by yourself? By myself. Wow. Listen to music. I just, I really just take the time. Mm. Do you find it peaceful? Beyond. Wow. Whenever it's really difficult for me, I go to the cemetery. Wow. And it's not that I feel her there, because I, I don't, I feel her with me. I don't right. really feel her there. But, you know, I just feel like I'm taking time out of my day to drive to the cemetery and be there with her. Right. And just one on one. And I and I and I, I talk to her and I say, I carry you with me yeah. everywhere I go. How would you say like you try to keep your mother alive to this day? Like for me, like keeping Francesco alive is having you here right now. You know, I see you, I see his family, and I love talking about him, good memories and pictures on my wall. Like for mm -hmm. is there anything that you do for your mom? I talk about her. A lot. A lot. I think when you talk about someone, you keep their name alive. Yeah. They say you die twice. The first time when your heart stops, the second time when people stop saying mm, your name. I love that. You know, you have control over that second part. True. Talk about them. You know, it makes them feel like they're still here. Yeah. Because in some, in my belief, in some way, they are. They are. Yeah. And I think when you talk about them and you talk about memories, you know, the only thing death ends is a life. Yeah. It doesn't end... An existence it doesn't end a relationship, you know. Yeah. So I think when you talk about them, they're still here, right. and and you're also bringing them up into conversation like they are still here. Yeah. And I still say all the time, I'm like, "Mommy used to do that. Mommy used to do that." Yeah. Mommy was a pain in the ass with this. I love you. <laughs> like, like I just. All right, Sal. We heard she was a pain in the ass quite <laughs> some time. Yes. Tell yeah, us yeah, how yeah, you yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right now, if, if I don't get hit by a car on the road. <laughs> but. She, <laughs> she, you know, I, I bring her up a lot. I don't know why. I'm, I think this was a while ago. You told me that you, t you used to light candles in your house. And then you went to a medium. And she was like, stop lighting the candles. Every night. Every night we would light a candle near her picture. We're, we're, we think we're doing a good thing. Right. <laughs> uh, like a cousin went to a, uh, okay. a medium and the medium was like, um, she says don't light candles. <laughs> she doesn't like it. She goes, knock it off. Oh, no. Uh, I don't know why, but it was it was like so weird. Like, so oh, did you stop? We stopped. Okay, good. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm surprised. We don't want the. Are you were painting us my whole life. Watch this. <laughs> Watch this. <laughs> Payback's a bitch. Right. But yeah, you know, I feel her all the time. Wow. Do you have like an example of a sign that you've experienced, like a very powerful one that? You know what it is, I had a job before this that I was miserable doing, and I wanted a new job in the worst way. Mm. But it's like, you know, the job searching process is so hard. Absolutely. It's so overwhelming and difficult and time consuming. You don't know where to turn first. And I kept going to the cemetery and I kept saying, Mom, find me a job. Mm. Because I had another cousin that went to a medium and the medium said, is he miserable doing what he's doing? Oh, no. Wow. And, you know, she was like, yeah. And look, was I miserable? No. Okay. But I was ready to move on. Right. I wasn't the happiest and I learned a lot. I was happy to be there. You know, I don't regret it. Right. But I was ready to move on. Right. And when the medium said that, I was like, oh, she's going to help him. So I kept going to the cemetery. I'm like, ma, find me a job. Find me a job. Find me a job. And she found me a job. Wow. And it was like, it was like I kind of felt like she you was the one like who, yeah. who really did it. Yeah. I feel like you just know. You just know. You know, and it's also, I think she liked... You know, I always try to keep her memory alive. So I have, last year I had this everyone over for yeah. the one year memorial. And that night, I don't wake up in the middle of the night. And I woke up and I felt like someone was in the room. Wow. 
Wow. And then I was like, okay, Ma, leave. I need to go back. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> I was like, okay, thank you for stopping. Anyway. Right. I need Appreciate to, it. I need to go back to bed. <laughs> but I, you know, wow. I, I feel her all the time. Do you believe that, like, time helps? There's, like, this controversial thing around that idea that, like, time heals. No, it doesn't. What do you think about that? I think time teaches you. Okay. I don't think it helps. I think the pain is still there. Mm. I still have the same amount of pain as mm. when it happened. Do I think it stings as much? No. But the pain is still there. I think you just learn, as time goes on, you learn how to deal with it. Mm. You know, you have a choice. You either let it consume you yeah. or you go on with your life. Right. And I hate when people say you move on. I hate that. Yeah, me because too. I don't think you ever move on. No. You move along, I you like to forward, say. Yeah. Because you compartmentalize your feelings and right. go on with your life. I think through time you learn how to do that. When it first happens, no. But I think time teaches you. I don't think it helps. What do you think was like the number one thing that you did that like truly gave you that next step into I am moving forward? Like what do you what was like the biggest thing that you were like, I'm so glad I did this? I think just as simple as just going out, having a good time again. Love that. Wow. I think that's the biggest step for a lot wow. of people. Wow. I am so intrigued that you said that because I still struggle a little bit with the guilt with that. You should have a good time. Wow. You should go out and have a good time. Wow. Live your I life. really wasn't expecting that. It's beautiful. Because my mom, if there's one thing she taught me, she taught me a lot of stuff. To have a good fucking time, right? Have a good time. And she taught me how to live. Wow. You know, and and I don't look at it as, oh, I'm, I'm going out, I'm having a good time, and here I am, I suffered a tragedy. I look at it as, yeah, but I'm living this whole life in mm. tribute to the one that she lost. Right. I think that's what I kind of look at it as. Wow. Go live your life, have a good time, remove the guilt. Yeah. You know? We're, we all expect to live long lives, but none of us are guaranteed that. Look at what happened to Francesco. He, he passed at 24. We're not guaranteed it. I know. And Francesca, if there's one thing Francesco taught us, is to live each day. Literally. Live each day. You said it best. He lived more of a life than like... In 24 years, <laughs> and some people have it in an entire lifetime. He flew a plane. It's crazy. <laughs> He's, he lived his life. He did. You know? He and did. I, even though he died young, we can turn around and we could say, he did a lot. Yeah. He made a difference. Yeah. You know? And I think that's what I would tell you is to go on. Go have a good time. Have dinner with your friends. I think that's when I when I started to do that, I said, okay, I got this. Hmm. And, and if you don't feel in the mood, you're not in the mood. Yeah. <sighs> wow. I learned so much from you for being here, so thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Is there anything else that you want to add in? I know you said that you wanted you were you wanted to extend, you know, for people to reach out to you if they ever want someone to talk to to your Instagram. Yes. I can put it below in the caption yes, for them to that's perfect. Reach out, you know. Yeah. Sometimes you need, it takes to talk to a stranger oh to God. feel better. It's easier and sometimes that way. Thank you. No problem. Anything Thank you for else? having me. That's it. Sal, you're the best. You're the best. Thank you.